Have I, uh, oh, can I start? Okay, good. Have I made anybody mad yet tonight? No? Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite, okay. Well, I'm going to make some people mad. All right? Some people are going to get ticked off. Some people are going to leave bad comments on YouTube for me. Good. Good. If they're not talking about you, then that's not good. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the Greek Jesus of the church versus the Hebrew Yeshua of Scripture. Um, in 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 2, we read this. For I'm jealous for you with a go godly jealousy. For I betrothed to you, one, uh, you to one husband, that to Messiah I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Messiah. For if one comes and preaches another Yeshua, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit from which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Messiah. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. Huh. He said there's other Jesuses being taught out there. There's other Messiahs. There's other Yeshuas being taught. <clears throat> well, here's what the church teaches. That Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. That's really not possible since there's no J sound in the Hebrew or the Greek. People say, well, that doesn't make any difference. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> the name Jesus comes from the Greek word Asus. I was just talking about that. That's because... Uh, the, he, the Hebrew uh, name Yeshua, um, the Greek doesn't have an SH sound. And it doesn't really have a Y sound. So it came out Asus. And according to Strong, Strong's Concordance, Jesus has no meaning. It's just a name in the Greek language, but really it's not even that. Scripture teaches that, on the other hand, we read in Genesis 49, verse 18, For your salvation I wait, O Yahweh. The Hebrew word for salvation is an interesting one. It's Yeshua. His name is salvation. If you use his name, his real name. Scripture teaches that Mary was told she must name her baby Yeshua because he will save his people. In Matthew 1, verse 21, And she will bear a son, you shall call his name Yeshua, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. So she, she was told to name your baby salvation. To change his name from Yeshua is to render his name to be without meaning. Now, is that right? Is that correct, I mean? Is that the right thing to do, put it that way? No. It's not the right thing to do. Scripture teaches Yeshua is the only name under heaven by which we must be saved. In Acts 4, verse 10, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Yeshua Messiah, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom Elohim raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. And he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. And there is no salvation, or excuse me, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. And that name is not Jesus. Well, here the church teaches that Jesus is one-third of a trinity consisting of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't care how you explain this. It implies there's either three gods or a three-headed god. I haven't really figured out what it's trying to tell me. I'm pretty good at math. And this three-in-one thing, it's something that's never been logically or satisfactory to explain. Explained at all. It's a pagan thing. 
there are some ancient pagan symbols that symbolize the same thing. Scripture teaches this. Yahweh or Elohim is one. Yeshua said, that's the foremost commandment, as a matter of fact. And one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? In Mark 12, 29, Yeshua answered, the foremost is hero Israel. Yahweh our Elohim is one. And you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So the foremost commandment they don't agree with. Church doesn't. Now, Scripture teaches that, and, and, I, and I have a lot of people ask me, well, then who is, who is Yeshua? Do you believe in the deity of Yeshua? Well, um, I personally don't like the question. The deity of Yeshua, well, what do you mean? Well, he's his Father's Word made flesh and dwelt among us. That's who he is. Does that mean he's deity? I'll tell you what it means. That means he's his Father's Word flesh that dwelt among us. That's what that means. Okay? You know where I get that from? That book again. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. Skipping down to verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, okay, so he's the Word of his Father that became flesh and dwelt among us. That's who he is. Um... What about his deity? I don't, the term deity is not in Scripture. I don't know what to tell you. He's his Father's Word made flesh, dwelt among us. It's his Father's spoken Word that he created everything with. He spoke that. Well, that Word that he spoke that created everything became flesh and dwelt among us. The church teaches the Lord's Day is Sunday. That's the day of the sun god. The Jesus of the church is the Lord of Sunday, the first day of the week. The Catholic Church often shows Jesus with the sun in the background or behind his head to further tie him to the sun god. You've seen these illustrations. Did I doctor them up, you think? No. That's the way they are. Lutheran Church has them too, don't they, Deb? Yep, look at all these images of Jesus. Did you ever think that they actually showed him with a halo all the time? That's what that is. That's a halo. Even this thing, on that's not a funny hat. That's a halo there on that one. <clears throat> you know, even uh, Protestant artwork, it's a little more subtle, but they still show much of the sun god imagery there. It's back there. It's back there. It accents that sun godness type thing. Oh, yeah, that one too. See? Scripture teaches Yeshua is, in his own words, master of the Sabbath, not master of the day of the sun. Why do you think they call it Sunday, anyway? Matthew 12, verse 8, For the Son of Man is the master of the Sabbath. And he was saying to them, in, verse, in Mark 2, 27, and he was saying to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for Sabbath. Consequently, the Son of Man is master even of the Sabbath. He's master of the Sabbath. Now, why wouldn't we want to honor that day? The church teaches... Jesus did away with the Torah, or instructions of Elohim, or the law, however you want to say it. They teach that he, they teach that he fulfilled it and made it somehow fade away. Uh, because of Jesus, Torah no longer applies to us, and we should ignore it. Now, they may not put it in that, those words, but they do. Um, there won't be any Sunday school class that you'll go and they'll really... Uh, dissect the Torah. They won't do that. That's a waste of time, they'd say, because it doesn't apply to us, they say. Scripture teaches Yeshua came to make the Torah have more meaning and fullness in our lives. Even the least of these commandments are to be followed nor to be taught. He explicitly states this in Matthew. Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. Now, this is where they say, aha! See? He fulfilled the law. Well, the Greek word for fulfill is plero. 
It means to make full or to fully preach or to make full. You know, do uh, you remember, and, and I could show you, go to a bunch of passages that have the word play rue in it, but none of them means to abolish something or do away with it. None of them mean that at all. Like, uh, for instance, when they weren't catching any fish, and Yeshua said, well, cast your nets over the side there. And they said, okay. And then the nets got so, so full that they couldn't pull them all in. You know what, what word was used to... Uh, the, the word says the nets were full. Play Roo. Okay, they were full. They were made full. That's what that means. It was filled up. See, I didn't come to abolish the Torah, but to fill it up because it's been depleted by those that have been teaching it the last few hundred years. I did not come to abolish, but to make full. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the Torah until all is accomplished. Has all been accomplished yet? No, I'm still here. No, nope, not all been accomplished yet. Whoever then annuls the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I'll be darned if I don't see preachers stop at the end of, at the end of 17 just with fulfill when the rest of it just goes and says more of the same to make it full, that it'll never, it'll never fade away. You can't annul any of them. First John 2, starting at verse 3. And by this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. That's how we get to know him, is by keeping his commandments. And if any of you were like me, and you went through... 40 years of your life not keeping his commandments. Then when you started doing them, you thought, oh, wow, I do know him better. I do know him now. That's how you get to know him. That's exactly right. I didn't know him before. He says, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. Huh. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of Elohim has truly been perfected. By this we know that we're in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Did he keep his father's Torah or not? If he didn't, he's not the Messiah. If he had one little mishap, one little sin, he was not the Messiah. But we know he was. Verse 7, the, the kicker. Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment's the word which you've heard. Which is that? What's the oldest part of the scripture? The Torah. That's what he's talking about. Nothing new, just the old you had from the beginning. Second Timothy 3, starting at verse 14. Paul writes this, you, and he's writing to Timothy. That's why it's called Timothy, because he's writing to him. You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faithfulness, which was in Messiah Yeshua. Huh. So he says, Timothy... Can keep doing what you've been doing since you were a child. And keep studying those sacred writings that you knew. Because your mother was a godly woman, and she brought you up in this way. And he talks about that elsewhere in the letter. <clears throat> Continuing verse 16. All scripture is inspired by Elohim. Uh, okay, when Paul was writing this, how much scripture was there? It was just the Tanakh. That's all there was, the Old Testament. That's it. All Scripture is inspired by Elohim. All Scripture is profitable for teaching. All Scripture is for reproof. All Scripture is for correction. And all Scripture is for training in righteousness. That the man of Elohim may be adequate, equipped for every good work. You want to be adequate in the eyes of the Father, equipped for every good work? What does Paul say to do? Do what the scriptures say. 
Do what the Tanakh says. Do what the Old Testament says. All of it, by the way. All, he didn't say, <clears throat> some of the scriptures are inspired by Elohim. Some are. And some are profitable for teaching. And some are profitable for reproof. And some are really good stories. Is that what he said? He didn't say any of those things. huh? All of it. All of it. The church teaches Jesus died on Good Friday, resurrected on Easter Sunday morning. He was in the belly of the earth for one and a half days. Huh, interesting. The scripture teaches the true Messiah would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. This is the only sign he would leave this evil generation that he is the true Messiah. Matthew 12, verse 38 says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Teacher, we want to see a magic trick. We want to see, a, we want to see something special. But he answered and said to, to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he was uh, actually crucified on Thursday, not Friday. And was in uh, the belly of the earth Thursday, Thursday night. Not all Thursday, but a good little portion of it. Thursday, Thursday night. Friday, Friday night. Saturday, Saturday night. And after the sun went down on Saturday night, he resurrected. The church teaches Jesus is coming to snatch the church people away in the rapture to be with him forever, right? He'll do this because the church people love him and refuse to obey his commandments. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Yeah, that's why. <clears throat> then the evil Jewish people will finally be dealt with by the Antichrist during a seven-year period of great Jewish and unbeliever tribulation. Now, you, you can use different adjectives if you want. That's exactly what's taught in most churches. It's exactly what's taught. And on TV. And on the internet. Scripture teaches King Yeshua, Messiah, is coming to set up his kingdom on earth. In Daniel 7, verse 18, But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Skipping down to verse 27. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. All the kingdoms you see now are going to be underneath the kingdom of Messiah, which is going to reign from Jerusalem. Revelation 5 verse 10 says, And you've made them be a kingdom and priests to our Elohim, and they will reign upon the earth. That's what it says. Now the church teaches people should celebrate, celebrate Christmas, Easter, and other holidays that originated from pagan worship. Christmas was originally a pagan festival honoring Saturnalia, the sun god. This horrible holiday involved human sacrifices followed by a big feast. Human sacrifices were eventually replaced by the giving of gifts. The pagan elements in the Christmas celebration, ranging from Satan claws to idolatrous trees, are obvious and abominable. I spelled Santa wrong. Same letters, it's and jumped out to the end. And <clears throat> the spring equinox, uh, that's tied into Easter, is 13 weeks. It's considered just a minor Sabbath. However, it did require a human sacrifice. And on March 21st to 22nd, the goddess Ostara, or Ishtar, also spelled Eoster, for whom Easter is named, March 21st is one of the Illuminati's human sacrifice nights. Easter is a shifting date using the common practice of astrology. It's celebrated on the first Sunday after the first new moon after Ostara. This date has nothing to do with the resurrection of Messiah. Rather, this day in the pagan tradition celebrates the return of Semiramis 
into her reincarnated form of the spring goddess. The pagans even have an equivalent to Good Friday. It's called Easter Friday and has historically been timed to be the third full moon from the start of the year. Easter is steeped in Babylonian mysteries, the single most evil idolatrous system ever invented by Satan. All throughout the prophetic scriptures, we see Elohim declaring his final judgment upon wicked Babylon, yet every year Christian pastors intone Easter as though it's virtuous. And some Baptist preachers have been referring to this day, celebrating Messiah's resurrection as Resurrection Sunday in order to separate the day from a pagan celebration. But giving it a better name doesn't separate it from a pagan celebration. The Babylonian goddess Ishtar is the one for whom Easter is named according to the pagan traditions of holidays. Page 9, in reality, she was Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, uh, and the real founder of the satanic Babylonian mysteries. After Nimrod died, Semiramis created the legend that Nimrod was really her divine son born to her. She's considered to be the co-founder of all occult religions along with Nimrod. Now, Easter, the day of Ishtar, is celebrated widely among various cultures and religions on the earth. In Babylon, Ishtar, Easter is also called the moon goddess. The Catholics are called the Virgin Mary or the Queen of Heaven. In Chinese, it's Xing Mu, but you knew that already. The Druids, uh, Virgo, Peritura, Egypt, Isis. The pagan Ephesians worship Diana. The Etruscans, Nutria, Germans, the ancient Germans, Hertha, Greeks, Aphrodite, Ceres, and Indians, Isi or Indrani. Ancient Jews worshipped a queen of heaven named Ashtaroth. Uh, Krishna worshipped Devaki, Rome, Venus, Fortuna, Scandin Scandinavians, Disa, Sumerians, Nana. So it's the same goddess, just different names for the goddess. Just depend on what culture it is. The Babylonians celebrated the day as the return of Ishtar. The precise names vary, Eoster, whatever, the goddess of spring. This day celebrated the rebirth or reincarnation of nature and the goddess of nature. According to Babylonian legend, a huge egg fell from heaven landing in the Euphrates River. The goddess Ishtar, or Easter, broke out of this egg. Later, the feature of an egg nesting was introduced, a nest where the egg could incubate until hatched. A wicker or reed basket was conceived in which to place the Ishtar egg. The Easter egg hunt was conceived because if anyone found her egg while she was being reborn, she would bestow a blessing upon that lucky person. Because this was a joyous spring festival, eggs were colored with bright spring colors. The Eastern bunny, bunny the uh, goddess's totem, the moon hare, would lay eggs for good children to eat. Yoster's hair was in the shape that Celts imagined on the surface of the moon, according to the pagan traditions of holidays. Thus, Easter, Yoster was a goddess of fertility. Since the bunny is a creature that procreates quickly, it symbolized the sexual act. The egg symbolized birth and renewal. Together, the Easter bunny and the Easter egg symbolizes the sex act and its offspring, Semiramis and Tammuz. <clears throat> the Temple of Ishtar. Well, the two principal deities of ancient Babylon were Baal and Ishtar. Baal was the god of war and the elements, and Ishtar the goddess of fertility, both human and agricultural. agricultural. These two deities have roots going back before Babylon to Nimrod at Babel and to Assyria. Through the ages, they were imported into other nations and under different names, they always retain, retaining the same basic characteristics. Baal was also called Bel, Balat, Moloch, Merodic, Mars, and Jupiter, and was frequently represented as a bull. Ishtar was also called Aphrodite, Astarte, Ashtoreth, Sibyl or Sibyl, Diana, Europa, Isis, Semiramis, and Venus. The two main elements in the worship of Baal were fire and human sacrifice, usually children. So that's what Elohim says. Uh, don't worship me, and we'll get to that in a minute, where he says that don't worship me the way these pagans worship their gods because they sacrifice their children even. I mean, that's the worst thing in the world is to sacrifice your children. And they do that. Don't worship me that way. 
the way they worship their gods. That's what he says. Ishtar was uh, worshipped via offerings of produce and money, as well as through fornication with temple prostitutes. It's this last characteristic that helps make the tie between religious Babylon and kings and merchants. In his book, The Secret of Crete, H.G. Wunderlich reports that before marriage, every woman in Babylon was required to go to the temple of Ishtar and lie with a stranger. We have a similar report from Gerhard Herm in his book, The Phoenicians, where women in the Canaanite cities of Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos were required to become prostitutes for a day and give themselves to foreign guests during the spring festival. This festival survives today in the name of Easter, which is derived from the word Ishtar. See, that's, uh, well, let me continue here. Note that the women were to prostitute themselves with strangers or foreigners. In ancient times, the foreigners in these cities were mostly composed of traveling merchants and political dignitaries. In the third century AD, the historian Eusebius, which one of the church fathers, by the way, described the patrons of these temples in this way. It was a school of godlessness for these dissipated men who had ruined their bodies in the pursuit of luxuriousness. The men were soft and effeminate, were no longer men. They had betrayed the honor of their sex. They believed they must worship their God with impure lust. And like it says here, it made the women prostitute themselves, all the women prostitute themselves during this time. That's why they carried over the uh, rabbits and the eggs to symbolize the sex acts. Huh. Wow. Wow. We read in Deuteronomy 12, starting at verse 1, These are the statutes and the judgments which you shall carefully observe in the land which Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, is giving you to possess as long as you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains, on the hills, and under every green tree. What, what is the world fixing to go worship here in just a couple months? Well, just a month and a half. It's not even a month and a half. Going to go worship under every green tree. Oh, we don't worship the tree. Oh, no, you don't worship it. You just put your finest, put, kneel down and put your finest new possessions underneath there to give to one another. What do the kids do as they walk past that? <gasps> Drool. Eyes bug out. Oh, they're not worshiping it. No. Uh-uh. Continuing here in Deuteronomy 12, verse 3. You shall tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, burn their asherim with fire. You shall cut down the in- engraved images of their gods. You shall obliterate their name from that place. You shall not act like this toward Yahweh your Elohim. Let me give you a hypothetical situation. Applies to no one that I know. Let me give you a hypothetical situation. Happily married couple for, let's say, 30 years. Wife goes to a Christmas party. Husband can't make it for some reason. What happens at Christmas parties? Nothing good. Wife has a fling, drunken fling, didn't mean to do it. Knows it got work. <clears throat> she admits it to him. Does the husband want a reminder of the guy that did? If he, let's say he, they can mend together over the next few years, and she works his way back and gets his trust back, at least a, a lot of it. And the husband, does he want to see a remnant of this guy in his house? Does he want to see a picture of this guy in his house? Does he want to see her acknowledge him in any way? Hell no. But what does the world do? Just the opposite. Idolatry is adultery. Idolatry is adultery. If that, if that guy that did that to his wife, if his favorite food is fried chicken... I guarantee you the guy's not going to eat fried chicken, will not even have the scent of it in his house ever again. Let's continue here. But we expect our Heavenly Father, oh, forget about it. This is for you. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, that's just what he wants. Verse 29, when Yahweh your Elohim cuts off before you the nations which you're going in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, beware that you're not ensnared to follow them after they're destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods that I also may do likewise? Verse 31, you shall not behave thus toward Yahweh your Elohim. You shall not act toward him. He says, don't act toward me the way they act toward them. Do not do it. For every abominable act which Yahweh hates, they've done for their gods. For they even, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. When you celebrate Christmas and Easter, what does he see? He sees sons and daughters being burned to false gods. That's what he sees. He says, whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. Hmm. Here's how Christianity justifies its sin. Um, Oscar sent me this just the other day from a wonderful Christian teacher named Solberg. He talks about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a video on him, on his videos. Uh, this guy's main thrust of at least one channel that he has is to show, he calls it, those, those involved in Torahism uh, are, are wrong and evil, okay? And I'm, I'm going to refute him and his stupid little points that he makes that are so easily refuted, just like this nonsense. Look what, this is on his website. The roots of Christmas. In the early years of Christianity, the birth of Jesus was not formally celebrated. Duh, it's not in the Bible to celebrate it. It wasn't until the 4th century that church officials decided to institute the birth of Jesus as a holiday, calling it the Feast of the Nativity. The date of Jesus' birth is not mentioned in the Bible, of course, but most scholars believe it probably occurred in the spring because shepherds shouldn't be herding in the middle of winter. However, Pope Julius I officially chose the date of December 25th for the holiday in an effort to capitalize on the traditions of the pagan Saturnalia Festival. They're not denying it. They're not denying it. By holding Christmas at the same time as the traditional winter solstice festivals, church leaders thought the chances would be greater that Christmas would be widely embraced. And it worked. And it's just like they... All you have to do is change the names. Just change the name. That's what they did in every culture with these false gods. You just change the name. Make the name something familiar. By the Middle Ages, Christianity had, for the most part, replaced pagan religion. Let's say not replaced it, brought it in. Brought it in. So in the same way that Messiah claims and redeems the hearts of sinful people and uses them for his glory, his church claimed and redeemed the pagan holidays and used them for Christ's Glory. Praise Jesus. Pagan festivals were turned into celebrations honoring the sending of God's only Son, begotten Son to earth. One could almost say the pagan holidays have been taken captive for Christ. RLSolberg.com. What a guy. Scripture teaches we're to keep Elohim's appointed times. Leviticus 23, starting at verse 1, Yahweh spoke again to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, Yahweh's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. What's convocation? Assembly. My appointed times are these. The list includes all the feast days beginning with the Sabbath day. It says when to keep them, how to keep them. <clears throat> Scripture says... Instead of using pagan holidays like Easter as a reminder of Yeshua, we're to celebrate Passover as a remembrance of him. Luke 22, verses 13 and 14, And they departed and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And they called this little cracker and grape juice ceremony the church is called the uh, communion or Lord's Supper is a joke. Yeshua was celebrating Passover. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. 
He said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So they changed, they, changed, they changed Passover into something with a little cracker and grape juice. Silly thing. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of Elohim. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of Elohim comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do Passover in remembrance of him. We read in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul writes, Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in Elohim who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. Yeshua said Passover was a remembrance to him because he delivered his people. In the same way Passover was originally a remembrance of the deliverance of his people from the bonds of slavery in Egypt. In Exodus 12, starting at verse 13, and the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day will be a memorial to you. What's the difference between a memorial, a memorial, and a remembrance? What's the difference? There is no difference. Same thing. It's, they're, synony they're synonyms. This day shall be a memorial to you. You shall celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Huh. What's that mean? Throughout your generation, celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. It means uh, quit doing it after Jesus dies on the cross. Is that what that means? <coughs> it's not what it means, is it? And lastly, I want to leave you with this thought. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. And I hope I showed you how much of Christianity is based on Scripture. Damn near none of it. Just the death part. Just the what? The death part. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. And that's all I have to learn from the scripture. Yeah. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2 says this. Thus says Yahweh, heaven's my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house where you could build for me? And where's a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares Yahweh. But to this one I will look. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. That's what he wants out of us. Is to be one of those who is humble, contrite of spirit, and tremble at his word. Because there's a lot to tremble at. <clears throat> we want those mercies that are shown that were shown to King David. You know, he was an adulterer and a murderer, but he was a man after Elohim's own heart. And he trembled at his word. Any questions on this? I'd called Mark and I told him, I don't think I've done this in 15 years. I won't recall it. Oh, and no study next Friday. There is one Sabbath a year to where we want you to assemble at home. That's the one for Thanksgiving. Okay? It is not a holy convocation. Thanksgiving is not. But everyone has family in. And the first couple years that we met on Friday night after Thanksgiving, there was, uh, let's see, the McGuire's and the Wilson's. <clears throat> that showed up, and that's about it. <clears throat> So we've decided this is the one day of the year we won't broadcast. Uh, we'll, well, you can do reruns on YouTube. How's that? We'll do a, do a best of. <laughs> I don't know what that'd be, but okay. <laughs> yeah, Rush is gone, I'm afraid, so can't imitate him. All right, let's, uh, any questions on that? All right, let's let's uh
pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Um, studying your word is truly a, a privilege uh, among uh, studying it with your people. We, uh, we thank you, Father, for your breath that leads us, uh, that leads us through your word. And Father, may, uh, may we be servants of yours of which you're not ashamed as we pray as your humble servants. Amen.